I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar. I think we're going to hear some results of some exciting research in in situ monitoring. I think this is going to be uh, especially relevant to all the folks that were involved with the rapid carbon assessment, uh, which also used a, a similar uh, technique or similar sensor. Uh, also, I, I really like in this research, we're going to find out how they dealt with uh, soil moisture uh, conditions, which is something that, that we were kind of plagued with a, a, along the way. Uh, Texas A&M has a, a very rich history of, of innovation and in, in research and, and promoting soil science. And Dr. Morgan, one of those professors down there that, is, that has certainly helped that along. I was fortunate enough to be down there uh, last week for the soil Sur Texas Soil Survey and Land Resource Workshop, in which there were over 100 people in attendance, uh, which really rivals many of our, our regional conferences. And this was just for, for folks and cooperators in Texas talking about things going on in, in land use management and, and soil science. And there was a field demonstration of the uh, penetrometer-mounted sensor that uh, we'll be hearing about today. I'm very pleased to be able to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Christine Morgan, uh, Professor of Soil Science at Texas A&M University. Uh, Dr. Morgan is also the Editor-in-Chief of Geoderma, which we all have copies of in, on our uh, coffee stands in our houses. So at, at this point, I will uh, turn the talk over um, and to Christine and, and welcome you to the webinar. Okay, thank you, David, and thank you to Sean for organizing this webinar. Um, so today I'm going to present the recent results of our measurements of soil properties from a penetrometer-mounted Vis and IR. And, uh, but first, I thought I would go and review a little bit of the basics of Vis and IR and how it works, overview kind of some of the problems that we faced when we started trying, thinking about how we would implement this, and then um, show you some exciting results that we have gotten here in Texas. Uh, my co-authors are Jason Ackerson. Jason is a PhD student that works with me. He'll be finishing up very soon. And he's just done a phenomenal job in um, getting, getting the data and troubleshooting and um, making sure the penetrometer works. Uh, my other co-author is Yu Feng Gu. And Yu Feng is an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And he's an ag engineer, and he probably he really did all the heavy lifting of getting this penetrometer made and uh, figuring out um, how how it should be. And and we I also have co-inventors that I acknowledge at the end, but might as well uh, mention them now. Um, the co-inventors of the penetrometer, along with Yu Feng, include David Brown at Washington State University and his former student um, Ross Brickelmeyer. Uh, so with that said, uh, today the topic is totally going to be about proximal sensing of soils. And um, I think most of the people attending this conference are soil scientists, so we're all familiar with uh, what it means to proximally sense soil because that's what we do on a daily basis. It's essentially getting the soil close up, and um, you can proximally sense soil with your hands, you can proximally sense soil with any part of your body, as my kids are doing here in this picture. Um, but you can also use a sensor or an instrument to do that. And uh, the instrument that we use is the, very similar to the instrument that NRCS used uh, for the, the rapid carbon assessment project. And actually, that was the motivation of this whole um, project was that NRCS had invested in these sensors and NRCS being um, a soil survey component of many soil scientists that are out in the field as we wanted to get these sensors out in the field um, for NRCS. But also in um, the work that we do, we're very interested, well, I'm personally very interested in, in field work as well and not so much laboratory work. But the Vision IR concept uh, started decades ago in the laboratory in this picture, you see the dried ground soil in a, um, in a glass container. And essentially, what visible near-infrared spectroscopy does, in the spectroscopy that we do, we shine a white light source onto that soil. And then we measure how the soil essentially reflects that white light source. And so in the bottom left of this slide, um, on the x-axis, you can see wavelength. And on the y-axis is the reflectance of a soil. 
And um, the kind of information that is that is in here, let's see if I can get this pointer to work. In the visible range, you can see that there's a steady increase in reflectance. Um, and then we have some what we call absorbances. Here's the first absorbance, a very large water absorbance here and here. And it's essentially the signature of these soils, the how they absorb and reflect light along this um, wavelength spectrum that we have found uh, relate to certain soil properties. And what the soil properties are, are clay content. Um, a lot of papers are out there showing the relationship between texture, um, sand, silt, and clay percentage with the spectral signature of soil. Uh, clay mineralogy, there hasn't been a lot with that, but early on, uh, in my career, David Brown published a very nice paper looking at categorical um, clay mineralogy information um, coming from VIS and IR spectroscopy. Um, a lot of the, probably people would do more work on the clay mineralogy with VIS and IR, more soil scientists, but as you know, uh, measuring clay mineralogy is very expensive and time consuming. Um, organic carbon, of course, is very, um, a very interested in soil property by all, particularly lately with the Soil Health Initiative of NRCS, we're interested in carbon. With the French Initiative, a cap per mill, the world is interested in carbon. And of course, with understanding soil's role in, in climate change and um, the sequestration and, and soil's role in the carbon cycle, we're all interested in organic carbon. And then, of course, inorganic carbon as well. Um, because Viz and IR is good at predicting clay content and clay mineralogy. Um, cation exchange capacity is another very natural link to what spectroscopy can measure. And also iron, um, pro something that we probably don't measure much in the contiguous United States, but in more weathered areas, iron is important. So on the, and though I didn't mention it, this was a little project that we did where we looked at, at gypsum in soil. And these, again, are dried ground scans of soil and a VIS and IR prediction of gypsum, which is pretty good. Um, we never published this because we couldn't find, um, we, we were unable to get some soil samples of between 40 and 80% gypsum. So let's go to the next slide. This is a very hot off the press uh, figure from Viscara Russell and all the cohorts um, that have contributed to the Global Spectral Library. So if you haven't seen this, you definitely want to get online. It's in Earth Sciences Reviews, and it's only as an accepted. So you can see it online. You can download tables, but if you try to download the PDF, it's got a watermark over it saying that it's in draft, or it's accepted, but it's not published yet. Um, but I love this graph because it shows on the um, y-axis all the things that I just mentioned, cation exchange capacity, pH, inorganic, organic carbon, uh, texture components, and iron. And on the x-axis, what you're seeing are classes, but really what they, those classes represent um, uh, the regionality of, of these spectral properties. And essentially what we're, what we're seeing here is that no matter at what scale, this and IR does a pretty good job of predicting these soil properties. So whether you're at like a Texas scale or a global scale. Um, another property, of course, we're in, I mentioned this to someone the other day and they just laughed and said, well, of course, Texas is interested in the coefficient of linear extensibility of soils. And yes, we are. And we do a lot of work in vertisols. And so that was a natural question for us to see how well this and IR could could directly predict the coefficient of linear extensibility. We don't think VIS and IR is actually measuring the change in the volume with water content because we're only measured these soils dried and ground. But what we were really interested in is we know that we have pedotransfer functions that use easy to measure soil properties um, like clay content. And so that's what you see on the, um, let's see, on the right axis is that, or the, the right graph is a pedotransfer function of predictions of the coefficient of linear extensibility using the old-fashioned or more traditional pedotransfer function method. We have put clay content into that model. And on the left-hand side, as you can see, a prediction of VIS and IR. And according to the R squared, the VIS and IR actually was a better, uh, was a better predictor of the coefficient of linear extensibility. 
and also compared the RMSD. So, you know, we're, what we found is that, of course, um, if you can measure clay content of soils, you can really relate it to a lot of other soil properties that may be of interest. Um, a really unique study that was done, oh goodness, this one was published in 2012, and this study uh, was in collaboration with Dr. David Weindorf when he was at LSU, and his PhD student at the time, Psalm um, Chakraborty, and uh, Psalm now is faculty at um, a university in India, and David now is faculty at Texas Tech University. But what we were interested in uh, was the ability to predict hydro or sense hydrocarbon content in soils. And total petroleum hydro hydrocarbon content is a pretty gross measurement of what of hydrocarbon content in soils, and it really doesn't tell you uh, what kind of hydrocarbon you have. And we didn't have a very good uh, success with looking at speciation, but we were able to predict total petroleum hydrocarbon decently well, which led us to think that we could predict it and that we could map it in the field. So we went out to the field and uh, scanned soils, and we're able to look at the uh, spatial variability of hydrocarbons in an area that we suspected there was a hydrocarbon spill, and then also look at the whole area and um, you can kind of see the gridded sampling scheme that we used in the bottom right-hand corner to uh, create the surface map of total petroleum hydrocarbon. I think it was in the top 30 centimeters of soil. And uh, what was really nice about this is that we were able to um, uh, map this total petroleum hydrocarbon for the area with help taking a lot of laboratory measurements once we had calibrated the machine. And the benefit of that, I think these samples are a little over $100 uh, per sample in the laboratory. Uh, so then this was another successful use of spectroscopy. So my point is, is that we can measure quite a few things with Vis and IR spectroscopy. Something like soil pH is, um, you know, we're not, I'm not completely sure what is being measured when we look at a Vis and IR prediction of soil pH, but it's probably related to the inorganic carbon the clay content, the clay mineralogy, and the texture of that soil. Um, so I think it, it, the important thing when you think about predictions with spectroscopy is what actually is being measured by the signal and then what we're relating that measurement to. For instance, I think you know, there's some, there is evidence to show that there's a fairly direct measurement of organic carbon and clay content but things like coefficient of linear extensibility is clearly an inference based on uh, being able to look at clay content and mineralogy. So this is what I've just showed you is just a brief overview of what VIS and IR can do in the laboratory, a little bit of what VIS and IR can do in the field. And um, so let's talk a little bit about the field and what it's like, what, a, what kinds of proximal sensing that you can do in the field. And I use this slide a lot in my classes and in a lot of my talks just to make sure that everybody is on the same page when we're talking about proximal sensing. So there's really two types of proximal sensing we can do in fields when we're looking at soils. And the first is surfing. And surfing is this concept that you want a high resolution surface map of how things are changing in space. So a, a sensor that is surfing uh, may, not, may or may not be invasive into the soil, so something like EM38 doesn't really even need to have contact with the soil. Something like a varus um, electrical conductivity is minimally invasive. And then something like varus also, I don't know if they still do, but they used to sell a spectrometer um, on a coulter that you could go across this field and get you know, um, spectral information. And that's what these the surface images are on the left-hand side are images from Veris technology from, these, from Christie in 2008 and Brickelmeyer and Brown in 2010. Um, and they're just showing that um, Veris was able to look at trends of soil organic carbon in space. The kind of proximal sensing that we are very particularly interested in is measuring soil properties with depth, because there's not a lot of proximal sensors that can do that. Generally, they require you pulling a soil core, and we're not interested in having to pull a soil core every time 
We just want to pull a soil core if we think there's too much uncertainty in our ability to predict the soil properties. And so on the right-hand side, you have a graph of soil depth and clay content on the um, x-axis. And this is a spectral um, prediction of clay content with depth every centimeter. Now, this was done from um, soils cores that were pulled, cut in half, and scanned in field condition before we had a penetrometer. And this was Travis Weiser's uh, master's thesis work. And Travis works for NRCS now as a soil scientist. So just a little bit more on motivation. Um, I'm not telling anyone, I think, on this line that um, as a soil scientist, anything they don't know. So here is a pretty aerial photo of uh, the floodplain of the Brazos bottom and some agricultural fields for interested in working. And you can see the spatial variability of the soil. And if we wanted to map this, the first thing I always do is, of course, go look at the um, soil survey. So next is an image of the uh, Sergo map. And we have clay content average from 0 to 50 centimeters. And as you can see, um, just like the photo, we see quite a bit of variability. We have very low clay content uh, in the middle of the field and high clay content mapped on the edge of the field, very high. And there are the, the, the clay does rain tremendously in this area, as um, here in the middle of the field is an old river channel. So if we over look at that Sergo map and then actually measure clay content, so the dots are actual measurements of clay content, and the color of the dots are the same scale um, as the um, color scale showing clay content. So if the dots match the color, then we have a good estimate of clay content. And as you all know, the Sergo is really off, because we're at a really small field scale variability that Sergo was not meant to do. On the right-hand side, we've just interpolated those measured values, and you can see a little bit more of how that variability is presented in the field. So that's, that is really looking at you know, the spatial variability of soil clay content. But in Texas specifically, in much part of the world, we have a lot of variability in soil clay content and soil properties in depth as well. And this is a picture of, I think it's mapped as a silua. But it's an um, alpha sol with a well-developed E horizon and some really nice um, reticulation in the argillic horizon and a fairly strong boundary uh, or abrupt boundary between the E horizon and the BT horizon. And so we know these things happen. And in um, another part of my research world, we use this kind of information to model the mass and energy fluxes associated with the soil, plant, and atmospheric interface. And if we don't have good information on the fact that this argillic horizon exists, uh, we can be really far off on our um, modeling estimates. And of course, from a pedological point of view, I mean, it's also very important to know where, uh, how the clay varies with depth. So this was our motivation in developing the penetrometer. And I'll show you another picture. of so These are soil cores along uh, the bottom of the slide, here, here, and here. And uh, top is it's some more results from Travis's hand scan. So literally, we pulled these cores, cut them in half, and Travis scanned these soils by hand. But one of the things that Travis did in his work is he not only scanned these soils wet, he also scanned them dry and dry in ground. So he actually made three prediction libraries. He could predict the soil clay content with depth from wet scans. So the calibration and the validation data were all in the same kinds of wet in field moist scans. And then he could also do it on dry scans. But he couldn't do, he couldn't create a calibration model on dry ground scans and then turn around and predict the um, clay content on the in situ moist scans. And so his work was a proof of concept that you can predict soil properties on soils that are wet and unground, but you had to have a wet, unground library in which to predict the soils. So to summarize all of that, you know, we have our data needs that we need. Um, we have limited spatial coverage of soil properties. We definitely have limited depth resolution information on soil properties. And uh, we wanted to address that with this technology. 
And so our overall objective was to develop a technique for soil measurement that was uh, rapid, allowed us to collect data rapidly and at fixed costs uh, with, some, with reasonable accuracy. We wanted this technology to be usable in the field, um, collect data at a very fine depth resolution so that we could move across landscapes faster and still get quality information on uh, soils as they varied with depth. So with that being the goal, um, the, the, thing, the other component all of, of all of this is that we have these spectral soil libraries. NRCS has a library, Texas has a library, Florida has a library. A lot of soil characterization labs contain these libraries. And essentially, you know, for many, many years, NRCS has supported the collection of soil and the characterization of those soil pedons. And then after being characterized, um, a, a dried ground sample of the soil was archived. With the um, advent of Vis and IR spectroscopy, a lot of um, scientists pulled those archived soils off the shelf and scanned them. So now we have this wealth of information of soil characterization data, and we have these dry ground spectral scans of these soils. So now we can develop these very in, um, explicit models that using the spectral signature of the soil and predicting soil properties. So for instance, in Texas, our uh, Texas Spectral Library has a little over 2,000 air-dried ground soils that we have scanned, which represent 44 counties in Texas, and there's over 200 counties in Texas, and um, roughly 280 pedons. And we actually could increase that, but we just haven't done that lately. Um, so this is one example of the state of Texas. And then, of course, I mentioned the Global Spectral Library, and they have um, tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands, of samples from all over the world. Um, so the components of moving this technology into the field is that we want to use this dried ground soil spectral libraries for field moist in situ spectral scans. Um, and to do this, there, we, we have to address the problem or, and, and the, the question of what happens when you scan a soil that's heterogeneous and try to predict it with a, dry, a ground sample. And, but the biggest problem is soil moisture, and I'll go into that. The other um, hurdle that we needed to overcome was equipment. At the time, Veris made a penetrometer, a, a Vis and IR penetrometer. I think they do still sell it and make it. Um, it wasn't going to go into tech, you know, dry Texas clay soils very well, so we needed a smaller penetrometer. But more importantly, we really wanted a penetrometer that worked with our own ASD spectra, um, spectrometer because, you know, with budgets on a shoestring, we really couldn't afford just to buy a whole new system with a whole new spectrometer. And we already had a spectrometer, and so we just wanted a plug-and-play, cheap, inexpensive piece of equipment to hook up to our already plenty expensive spectrometer. And then after we got all that sorted out, you know, we needed to test the field methodology, you know, what what works, what doesn't work, and how are we actually going to acquire these spectral signatures in the field. So the very first challenge to overcome was the effect of soil moisture. And the way we were going to address this previously was based off of Travis Weiser's work where we were thinking, well, we'll just have to make a library of intact soil cores. So the idea was for the rest of my career, anytime I went somewhere, I was going to pull a soil core, bring it back to the lab, scan it, and do um, laboratory analysis on increments of that core. So you can imagine that was going to be an expensive and enduring endeavor. Um, so we were always on the lookout for a way to remove the effect of water content, um, particularly without knowing the water content of the soil. And this is an example of what water content can do to uh, the reflectance spectra of a soil. So in the top right-hand corner, we have, again, wavelengths on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have reflectance. And this is the exact same soil scanned at different water content. So we have an air-dry soil all the way to 20% gravimetric water content. And you can see this range has a nonlinear and significant effect on the reflectance spectra. And what that means is if we take our library of dragged ground spectra, 
develop a prediction model for clay content, and then turn around and try to predict clay content for these individual spectra, we get what you see um, on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. We have measured clay content on the x-axis and predicted clay content on the y-axis. And um, you can see for the two drier soils, the black and the blue soils, the library didn't do half bad job of predicting clay content. However, if you get a little bit of moisture in that soil like the green, and then a lot more moisture like the red and the orange, um, we're, we have no sensitivity or no ability really to predict the clay content of the soil. And so um, what, we, what we, we ended up using uh, was based on uh, work that was done in France on um, removing the effective temperature on, I think it was apple juice um, scans. So they were scanning apple juice, wanting to look at the sugar content of apple juice, and temperature was affecting their ability, variability in temperature was affecting their ability to predict sugar content. And um, what they came up with was this external parameter orthogonalization. And the big picture here is that you can take your raw Vis and IR spectra, which is represented by this matrix X, and you can decompose it into a useful component and then what they call a parasitic component. In our case, the useful component is the part of this spectra that tells us about how the clay is affecting the absorption peaks. And the, un the parasitic or the unuseful component is the information on how the water content is changing that. And so how we so first of all, we have to create this P matrix, so this X of P, we have to estimate that. And we're able to estimate that by taking a, a subset of the library or a subset of soils, and it turns out that 100, 100 soils tends to be, you know, 100 soils that represent soils in your library tends to be a, a pretty good estimate of how many you need. And you need to scan those soils in a dry condition and then that same soil in its heterogeneous intact field condition. And we actually had that data from Travis Weiser's work because he had scanned them in the field at moist and then we had turned around and dried and ground them and scanned them again. So we could use Travis's and develop what we call the P matrix. So we can estimate P and then we can project that spectra onto the library. So uh, on the top right, you can see spectra of a soil before the EPO. And then after we multiply each of those spectra individually by this one P matrix, we can now see that the spectra are collapsed on top of each other, and um, they're fairly similar. So if we multiply this P matrix by, uh, at, by multiply the P matrix uh, against all the soils in the spectral library, and then also multiply it by the spectra that we collect in the field, we can collapse them on top of each other so they're only showing the useful component of that spectra. Uh, just to give you a little bit more vision of what that might look like, we tested this on a lot of different soils. So we tested it on soils from Texas. Um, our colleagues from Australia tested it on their soils uh, there too. And then we also had a colleague, um, Jose de Mate at Brazil, who who furiously, we told him about this idea, and he went and collected a lot of soil samples in the field, scanned them in the field, brought them back to the lab, dried them, scanned them dry, sent us the data and the laboratory data. And again, we're predicting clay content of his soil samples with the EPO correction and without the EPO correction. And just to give you some visuals, this nice colorful plot, two-dimensional plot in the middle, the right hand of the slide, is the P matrix. So above, again, we have the spectra that are affected by being in the field condition multiplied by this P matrix, and now we get the spectra that are collapsed and we've reduced the effect. And if you're more interested in this, there are, um, if you look at the paper by Ackerson and DeMont and myself and Geoderma, you can get all the references and understand how this works. And then more recently, um, my colleague Yufunga has also published with his graduate student Nuon and Geoderma looking at this correction and comparing it to a potential other correction. Okay, so we've, we've taken care of the problem of water content. Now we need to take care of the problem of equipment, and this is where Yufung's expertise came in. Again, we wanted a plug-and-play penetrometer, so Yufung developed some prototypes 
Um, and again, we did this with David Brown. So David would make a prototype, find out the problems. We'd make a prototype, talk to David. David would make a pro prototype. So we toggled back and forth until we both had something that we liked. And uh, the example of what we liked, um, here's the actual bottom of the penetrometer. So here, the tip is on the left-hand side. There is a sapphire window into, uh, drilled into the penetrometer. And then inside the penetrometer, we have a lamp, which is our white light source, a mirror that reflects that white light source onto the soil, and then a fiber optic that is actually bent in the exact same configuration as the contact probe and the mug lamp of the ASD. So what uh, we did here is we created something where we just have to stick a longer fiber optic um, connected to our ASD spectrometer. And we have preliminary data that had show, you Feng played around with the configuration just to make sure that we had data coming out of the penetrometer that looked just like Travis Weiser's data that he had collected with contact probe. So once we were happy with that, we, um, Jason Ackerson integrated all of this onto the back of our Giddings probe. Um, so we have the computer here all connected up to uh, the penetrometer here. And then we also have a depth gauge hooked up to all of this. And you can see this looks like a wiry mess, which is something you really don't want in the field. But again, we're working on a budget. And now you can buy all of this. Uh, the spectrometer now collects data on a handheld field computer, and it's all wireless. So with a little bit of engineering, uh, this can be cleaned up to something that works quite, quite well in the field. And here's just a visual of the penetrometer. Um, a computer-generated visual, the penetrometer going down into the soil. So the next test, next step was to test this thing. When we had it going, Jason went out um, around Bryan College Station. We have extremely variable soils. So we have a, a site that you have seen already in the floodplain of the Brazos River. And then we come up on the terraces of the Brazos. And he's actually included two different, at least two different terraces of the Brazos. They're very dissected in this area um, where he um, looked at a few alpha sols and vertisols and maybe an entosol or two. And then two other areas uh, here and here that are, I think this actually is also on the terrace, and then an area on the upland, and the upland being the coastal plain sediments uh, around Bryan College Station. So the point here is that he's looked at soils um, with vastly different parent materials, because we really wanted to put this thing to the test. And what he did at each of those sites, is he pushed the penetrometer into the ground and took a measurement of every five centimeters of the uh, visible near infrared uh, reflectance of the soil. Then he also took two soil cores um, and also two in situ visinar profiles every five centimeters. And on one core, he measured the clay content and also the dry ground visinar. On the other core, he measured the water content because we were just interested in that. And so what you're seeing now is a principal component decomposition of the soil spectra that, they, that Jason had taken. And the um, convex hole here in black, just, and you know, all of, all of this is is just a cartoon of the spectral space that these soils um, inhibit. So the library is in black, and the centroid of the library is right here. And then the dried ground soil used um, in the EPO is in blue. So you would expect the dried ground soil that we use for the EPO to look like the library soil. But the data that he took with the penetrometer, you can tell the centroid is totally off of the convex hole from the library. And then also the space of the penetrometer data does not share the same space with the principal components of the library and dried ground. And that's the problem. That's why we're unable to predict soil properties without um, altering this data. So after he multiplies everything by the P matrix, now you can see on the right-hand side, so after the EPO, that um, the, the spectral space is shared by all. And there's very good overlap, and the centroids are similar as well. So how did this perform? Um, so this is the results of the data of predicting clay content um, from those fields that were collected around Bryan College Station. Without the, so on the y-axis is the predicted clay content. 
On the x-axis is the measured clay content. You can tell this is in a very short distance. We got a huge range of clay contents from um, near zero to over 60% clay. And without the EPO, we have really very little ability to predict clay, and the error is 30% uh, clay. But once we use the EPO, we're now able to predict the clay content of the soils using the library and the in situ scans of soils uh, with the root mean squared error or an error of about 8% clay with no bias and a pretty high R squared. So we're very happy. Um, we have a good bias for a clay prediction. And our error of the clay prediction is very similar to that of the laboratory. Um, and another thing that we did with this that I, I like to show for those that are more versed in spectroscopy is that um, Jason also did a site-wise performance test where he did not use any information collected in one parent material to develop the EPO and then used only the data collected in that parent material to validate. So this is a very independent, very tough, conservative way to validate or test this kind of information. And we still get really good predictions. In the terrace, our root mean square to error is about 10% clay. And in the upland residuum, it's about 9% clay. And we, in, um, there's a, it's matching the one-to-one -one line quite well. And lastly, to just give you a picture of what this looks like um, in real, in a, a soil profile, again, on the y-axis, we have the soil depth. And on the x-axis, we have clay content. Uh, the dry ground spectral per OSC, the measured clay content is in blue. So this was bulk soils that were uh, measured in the laboratory using the pipette method. The dry ground spectral prediction, so if this is if we had pulled the core, ground it all up, scanned it with depth, which was done, um, you would get these open circle predictions. So it's really under prediction, well, not really, because they're really low clay contents, but it's under predicting the clay content um, and doing a pretty good job in the argillic horizon. And then lastly, um, our goal is the in situ spectra, and those are the solid black lines. And you can see the in situ spectra is fairly close to the laboratory data, but you're also getting you know, this nice, a little bit of a bump in clay content. It's very consistent. And then a decrease in clay content, um, a little under 30% clay. So we get very nice, continuous information. It's not perfect. It's not as good as the laboratory. And we never really expected that it would be. But we're very happy with the, the continuous um, depth and the consistency in the predictions. And you can see some. Um, a few of these predictions that are a little bit off. And there's iron manganese and a lot in redox in these soils. Uh, one of the pushes that Jason did was that soil with the, the extreme redox. And it still works very well. So the question is, is how does this work in a uh, digital soil mapping sense, especially if um, our data, our predictions aren't, aren't really perfect? And, and the VIS and IR is definitely, you know, contributing to this digital soil mapping concept uh, by providing more soil data in addition to laboratory data. Um, so what happens if we have a lower quality data in the soil input side of digital soil mapping? So once again, we're back out to this field where we have Sergo data. And then we collect covariate data with the EM38. So the EM38 in any digital soil mapping, no matter what scale you're at, you're going to have some covariate data. And we chose the EM data. Um, so here is an electrical conductivity map of that field. You can see it's a very nice covariate for clay content. And just to give you an idea, uh, the black dots are where we validated this. The white dots are where we had hydrometer methods. And then the um, pink dots are where we had in situ spectral measurements. Uh, so first thing we do is we take the EC data on the uh, x-axis and relate it to clay content measurements. So we have two sources of information. We could relate it to clay content method, me, um, measurements using the hydrometer, which is the lab standard. And when we do that, um, our R squared is about 0.8. Or we could take the vis NIR in situ measurements. Our R squared is much lower, 0.59. Our p-value is much lower. We have a lot less um, um, confidence in this information. But we could still say, OK, well, this is what we have. We only have. Um, lower quality VIS and IR data, and we still need to try to predict clay for this field. 
Um, and so the performance, this is this example of predicted clay contents and measured clay contents once again. Again, the hydrometer is the best way to go. Our model using hydrometer has a root mean squared error of about 5%, which is about the error of the hydrometer. And if we use the VIS and IR, we're looking at an RMSE of almost 8% clay content for predicting clay for this field. And because we all like pretty pictures, here's the last picture of the soil property maps. The top right-hand corner is using the hydrometer, and the lower bottom is using the in-situ soil. So in conclusion, um, we're happy. We think the VIS and IR equipped penetrometer can accurately measure in situ clay content as well as other soil properties. We're just waiting for the lab to get back for cation exchange capacity. We really couldn't develop this, model, this particular experiment for uh, carbon because we didn't have much range in inorganic or organic carbon out in our sites. But we also got this data at a high depth resolution and we conclude that it is an effective tool for digital soil mapping, even if the data is not as high quality as laboratory data. Uh, so lastly, I would like to acknowledge funding. Uh, the penetrometer work particularly was funded by USDA and the Lincoln Lab, but we've also had early support from Texas Soil Survey um, that was able to get us going and, and show proof of concept. Also, I want to acknowledge the co-inventors of the penetrometer, David Brown and Ross Brucklemeyer. And then, of course, Jose DeMott is our Brazilian collaborator. And Katrina Wilkie and Travis Weiser were my master's students at one time. And they really laid the foundation for this kind of work, um, as well as, of course, um, the University of Nebraska and Texas A&M AgriLife Research. So with that, I thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to um, address any questions that anyone might have. Well, thank you, Christine, and we'll give people a moment to compose their questions and enter those in the Q&A pod. We do have a couple questions that have been submitted. Uh, the first, where are the differences between PTF and visible NIR for coal statistically different? Um, okay, so that question is from Zamir. Let's get back to slide six. Where, 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 where? Um, were they statistically significant? Mm, probably not. Um, this is a pedo transfer function where we use only clay content. If we use clay content and cation exchange capacity, the pedo transfer function using clay content and cation exchange capacity is significantly better than vis and IR. But again, when we're looking at using proximal sensing, we're not really, we're not that concerned whether or not it's statistically significant. What we really want to know is, it's, is it useful? Is it going to aid in helping us collect more data faster, knowing that it could be at a lower quality? So the next question is from Zamir as well. How does the purity of the total petroleum hydrocarbon compare with soil organic carbon, and how does this affect the strength um, and identify of this signal? Okay, so the question is, is there if interference between soil organic carbon and total petroleum hydrocarbon, I think is probably the question. Um, I'm trying to remember back to that paper, because Psalm did look at that, and I don't think that we found a significant interaction between them. And so the next question is from, TD, how does this model differ from the Earth IT models circa 2000? OK, I'm not sure what this model is. Um, so I, I know what Earth IT was doing around 2000 is they were, um, they had, R, they were, had RGB in their penetrometer, not VIS and IR. And Dan, had some algorithms that associated RGB, um, and he had tip resistance of the penetrometer and sleeve resistance of penetrometer, and he was taking that ratio to get the information on soil texture. So this is different. This is, um, even though they're both kind of empirical relationships, the tip and sleeve ratio um, probably does, as I, I'm trying to remember back from his, um, dissertation work, the errors were a little bit higher. 
than this Viz and IR. And of course, with Viz and IR, you're getting more than just texture information. You can get inorganic and organic carbon and, and um, some other information as well. Christine, there's another question from Zamir. How could we combine the measured data by analytical methods with multiple sensors to improve spatial predictions? Oh, okay. So I think what Zamir is getting at there is that there are measured data in the laboratory is of really high quality, and the VIS and IR is not as good a high quality. Um, and you know, traditionally when you Krieg or co Krieg or regression Krieg or something like that to combine point data with this high proxim with um, like the surfing kind of data, you lose information on accuracy. Um, I guess what I can I can send Zamir I can send you a PDF, but we published a paper on that in 2004. It was in my dissertation because we I worked with the statistician because we had the same question. We were using Dan Rooney's Earth IT tip and sleeve penetrometer and getting not you know good information, but not as good as lab data. And then we had a so we had a couple of fields where it just took about three or four cores enough to calibrate Dan's data, and then we had a, a better spatial coverage of Dan's tip and sleeve information, and then we had EM38 data. And we actually, we didn't use geostatistics, we used a, a lattice statistic uh, concept where we could build models that incorporated the uncertainty from different sources of data um, so that a, a high quality piece of information with more certainty would override low quality information at a similar location. And Another question. Then, go ahead. Another question. What are the best practices for calibrating other materials? And they've listed uh, things fertility-wise like N, P, and K. Okay. Well, I. My professional opinion is that I don't think there is a best practice for calibrating Vis and IR for N, P, and K. Viz and IR might predict NP and K for a given field because of its relationship uh, with the in the hydrology and yield potential associated with clay content and organic matter. So if Viz and IR actually maps nitrogen, it's because of um, that relationship, and that relationship will probably not hold when you move to another field um, two miles down the road. Uh, so that's where I was talking earlier about being aware of what VIS and IR is actually measuring. And then when you're correlating it to something, recognizing that you know, VIS and IR is measuring clay content, clay mineralogy, inorganic, and organic carbon. And um, when you want to turn around and use something like that to predict nitrogen, um, you probably are in a fairly localized um, calibration area. I'll ask a somewhat related question. How big does a calibration library need to be? Do you have any thoughts on, you know, at least so many samples or uh, okay. some some point you reach a point where it's just kind of saturation, you just don't get yes. anything from it? Yeah. Well, um, I don't know if I have a feeling for how big it needs to be. You know, a couple hundred minimum, I would say. But most importantly, you probably want to do some sort of principal component analysis to make sure that the area in which you're trying to do it. So if you've gone out with the Vis and IR, let's say, and you've probed a field or a region, you probably want to take those spectra back to the lab and do a little that principal component decomposition and compare it, like I showed those convex holes, to make sure that the spectral data that you want to make a pr prediction on are at least represented spectrally in the library. So you don't want to extrapolate. You want to just make sure that you're using apples to predict apples. Any other questions out there? Another question, have you done any work with spectral fusion? Oh, sensor fusion? Sensor fusion. 
Um, well, I think, so first of all, sensor fusion means a lot to uh, different people. So I would, in this example, um, an idea of sensor fusion is adding the um, penetration resistance and now looking at both penetration resistance as you push the penetrometer down and the associated vis and IR. Um, I think David Brown has done a little bit of work with that, and we have some good ideas where we think that we can use this to get some information that might be quite hard to collect, um, but we haven't done it yet. It's just a, a nugget of an idea. <laughs> And then maybe one final question uh, has to do with future tests. What do you think we can do? Okay. Well, for future, I mean, the first thing that we really need to do is ruggedize this, um, engineer it for field work. So we've proved that it works, and we've proved that we have all the little pieces to put together. And I think the first step is just making it so that, you know, it's just a little bit safer with get up, upgrading the system and engineering it better. Um, but then the next thing is essentially what Kristen mentioned on with sensor fusion. Uh, we want to start collecting uh, penetrometer data with the VIS and IR. And then we also are thinking about um, sticking a little electrical conductivity probe on there so that we have an independent estimate of water content. So we're thinking with penetration resistance, VIS and IR, and water content measurements that we could really, independent water content measurements, that's the key, is when you're dealing with sensor fusion, you want to make sure your sensor sources are independent of each other, and they're not really dependent on the same physics. And uh, with that, uh, we think that we can um, do, do a lot of work with understanding soil porosity. This, uh I guess one more question is because it's hard to follow up on this one. In your presentation, you created the EPO matrix to adjust for water. Could you use other properties that confound the measurement? So maybe you can clarify that. Okay. So other things that confound the measurement are heterogeneity and temperature, because soil temperature varies quite significantly with depth. But because what we're doing now is we're scanning the soils with depth and then for the EPO component of the work, where we decide to do an EPO, we pull a core and we scan it dry. So really, what the EPO is doing, it's removing all the confounding components, including changes in temperature, changes in water content, and any effect of heterogeneity that we can pull out of that signature. So really, this parasitic component that we're pulling out is um, a, a mixture of, of everything that's confounding um, because we're pulling it out with respect to the clay content information that we want left behind to model. And that would be the same with inorganic carbon. I mean, we've shown this works with total carbon and inorganic carbon. And um, so, I mean, we're pretty confident that it works with any of the fundamental soil properties that VIS and IR can measure. Dr. Morgan, I want to thank you for your time and effort to make this presentation today. And thanks to all participants for joining in. We had more than 100 people join today's webinar. The on-demand recording of this webinar will be available on our center's YouTube channel within a few days. So feel free to let your colleagues know about this training opportunity. And this concludes our presentation. Thanks, everyone.